Yours for Justice, Ida B. Wells, The Daring Life of a Crusading Journalist, written by Philip Dre, illustrated by Stephen Alcorn. Ida B. Wells was born a slave in Holly Springs, Mississippi in 1862. The Civil War had started the year before, and sometimes her town was filled with the terrible sounds of battle. For the Wells family, though, work went on much as it had before the war. Jim and Lizzie Wells were slaves who belonged to a white, named, named, white man named Mr. Bowling. Jim was a carpenter in Mr. Bowling's shop, and Lizzie served as the family's cook. The Wells were treated better than many slaves. Mr. Bowling did not whip or beat them from stakes, and he gave them enough food and clothing. But his slaves were still his property. Mr. Bowling could even choose to sell baby Ida away from her family if he wanted. When Jim and Lizzie heard rumors that there were people working to end slavery, they treasured the hope that they, and especially Ida, might one day be free. When Ida was nearly three years old, the Civil War ended. Slavery was made illegal, and people like Ida and her parents were finally free. Jim and Lizzie Wells began building a new life for themselves. Lizzie stopped working and stayed home to take care of Ida. Jim kept his carpentry job, but Mr. Bowling now paid him for his work. Some whites thought that black people were not ready for the responsibilities of freedom, especially voting. As election time drew near, Mr. Bowling told Ida's father who to vote for. He made it clear that if Jim wanted to keep his job, he had better do what he was told. On election day, Jim Wells proudly cast his vote for the men he thought would be best for Mississippi, not for Mr. Bowling's candidate. When he got back to the carpentry shop, his boss had him locked out to punish him. Determined not to be defeated, Jim Wells bought some tools and started his own carpentry business. He also moved his family into a house away from Mr. Bowling. At the time, Ida didn't understand why. But as she grew older, she realized that her father had refused to work for a man who would not respect his rights. Freedom was far too important for him. Before the Civil War, many slaves like Jim and Lizzie were not allowed to learn to read and write. When Ida was old enough to attend Holly Springs New School for Black, her mother went with her. Once Lizzie learned enough to read her Bible, she stopped going. She needed to stay home to care for her growing family but she made sure that her children kept at their lessons. Ida found she especially loved to read. One by one, she read every novel at her school and church libraries. Although Ida liked going to school, she often had a hard time getting along with others, especially her teachers. Even at this early age, Ida had a mind of her own and didn't hesitate to give her opinion. The oldest of eight children, Ida found that a strong will sometimes came in handy. She was a great help to her mother in doing household chores and in looking after her younger siblings. One of her favorite chores was reading newspapers aloud to her father and his friends at night. Reading these articles gave Ida knowledge about the world far beyond Holly Springs, and she saw how powerful the written word could be. When Ida was 16, a yellow fever epidemic swept through Holly Springs. Many people in their town got the horrible disease and to Ida's great sorrow, her parents and a baby brother died from it. Friends and neighbors argued over who should take care of the Wells children. When Ida heard them making plans to break up her family, she couldn't remain silent. She announced that if the adults would help her find a job, she would take care of her brothers and sisters herself. At first, no one believed she could do it, but Ida would not take no for an answer. Someone suggested she tried to become a teacher in one of the smaller country schools, and Ida agreed. Her aunt lowered the hands of Ida's dresses and taught her to put her hair up. When she saw herself in the mirror, Ida couldn't believe her eyes. She looked like a grown-up. A few weeks later, she passed the teacher's exam with high marks and began her first teaching job. Ida quickly found that passing the exam was much easier than teaching her lessons. Her schoolhouse looked more like a barn than a classroom, and it was usually very crowded. Many students were so poor, they often didn't have enough to eat, and this made it hard for them to learn. To make matters worse, Ida had to teach all ages at the same time. With only a few books and supplies, her work was nearly impossible. 
But Ida faced up to the challenge. She carried wood for the fire to keep her students warm and helped each one through the day's lesson. She even advised the older students about their problems at work and at home. As a month went by, many of Ida's students began to show great progress. Some were so grateful that they brought her small gifts of eggs and other goods from their farms. When her brothers and sisters were older, Ida was able to take a better teaching position in Memphis, Tennessee, a bustling city of streetcars and steamboats. To Ida, it was a whole new world. The new teaching job was difficult, but Ida was paid more money. She was able to shop for the finest dresses, gloves and boots, and especially stylish hats. She caught the eye of more than a few young admirers, but she had too many plans to think about marriage. While other girls she knew were beginning to marry and have children, Ida dreamed of becoming an actress, a journalist, or even a novelist. She joined a group called a Lyceum. Each Friday, she and other teachers met to read essays or poetry and debate their ideas. These lively meetings, Ida said, were a breath of life to me. When the editor, editor for the Lyceum's journal moved away, Ida was chosen to take his place. In addition to edit, editing the publication, she began writing simple, practical essays that addressed the problems she had seen as a teacher. While other women journalists of the day wrote mainly about family issues, Ida also covered subjects like politics and religion, and this made her writing popular with both men and women. Many people in Memphis started to notice Ida. She attended social gatherings, parties, and concerts, and her name sometimes appeared in the pages of Memphis papers. She had found her voice, and quite a few others had began to listen. Sadly, Ida found plenty to speak against. Many whites still did not see blacks as equals, and they were working harder than ever to take away black people's freedoms. Some store owners refused to sell to black customers, and they put up whites only signs in their windows. Certain restaurants, hotels, and even train cars were now off limits to black customers. And new segregation laws, sometimes called Jim Crow laws, made this type of administrate of discrimination legal. One day, Ida boarded the train to her school. A few minutes into the trip, a conductor came to her seat and told her that the first class railroad car was only for white people. He told her she had to move to a car for black people. Ida replied that she had bought a first class ticket and would remain in her seat. Ida's response made the conductor very angry. He asked some other men to help him and they forced Ida out of her seat. Ida was frightened, but she would not be bullied. Rather than ride in another railroad car, Ida chose to get off the train, but like her father, she would not give up on her rights without a fight. When Ida got back to Memphis, she hired a lawyer to help her sue the railroad company. She hoped the courts would rule that the conductor and the laws that protected him were wrong. Perhaps if she won her case, it would set an example for fighting Jim Crow laws across the nation. Months later, Ida was delighted when a white judge in Memphis ruled that the railroad would have to pay her $500. She had fought to defend her freedom and she had won. Unfortunately, Ida's joy was short-lived. The railroad appealed the decision to the Tennessee Supreme Court and it overturned Ida's victory. She was disappointed for her loss, but most of all, Ida was heartbroken for all the black people who would continue to live under Jim Crow laws. I had hoped for such great things for my suit for my people, she wrote in her diary. And just now, if it were possible, I would gather my race in my arms and fly away with them. She had lost one battle, but Ida looked for other ways to fight the Jim Crow laws. An editor of a church publication called The Living Way asked her to write an article about her court case against the railroad. Her article was so successful that it was reprinted in newspapers around the country. Although Ida was still teaching, she continued to write for The Living Way. Both men and women found that her practical and formative articles helped them in their daily lives. Soon, her fans were calling her the princess of the press. 
The owners of a local newspaper called the Free Speech and Headlight were impressed with Ida's writing and they asked her to work with them. She became a partner in the business and began to write for the paper, now renamed the Memphis Free Speech. In the following years, Ida attended several conventions for black journalists. She was elected secretary of the Afro-American Press Convention, where she met many influential people. Even T. Thomas Fortune, co-owner of a respected black newspaper called the New York Age, made a point of meeting her. This introduction would prove to be very important for Ida later on. <clears throat> Ida liked writing so much that she longed to give up her teaching job, but to make a living as a journalist, she knew she would have to persuade many more people to buy the free speech. So she rode trains through Mississippi, Tennessee, and Arkansas, meeting people and urging them to read her newspaper. Ida and J.L. Fleming, one of her business partners, came up with the unusual idea of printing the free speech on pink paper. This made the newspaper more distinctive, and even people who couldn't read immediately recognized it as the free speech. Within a year, their hard work paid off. Subscriptions to the free speech went from 1,500 to 4,000. Ida was now able to support herself with her writing. Although newspaper work was demanding, Ida said she was happy in the thought that our influence was helpful and that I was doing the work I loved. One spring day in 1892, while on a speaking tour, Ida received terrible news. Her good friend, Tom Moss, had been killed. Ida rushed back to Memphis at once. When she found out what had happened, she could hardly believe it. Tom Moss and two other men ran a popular food store in Memphis called the People's Grocery. A white man who owned a store nearby became jealous of their success and let it be known that he wanted to put Tom's store out of business. Tom knew that he and his friends could not depend on the Memphis police for protection. They would have to defend the store themselves if any trouble developed. Tensions in the neighborhood continued to rise, and one night several white men stormed the people's grocery. Tom's friends fired their guns and the attackers fled. No white men were charged, but Tom and his friends were arrested. Tom hoped a judge would understand that they had been trying to protect their property. But before he and his friends could make their case in court, a mob of white men took them out of the jail and murdered them. This kind of execution outside the law was known as lynching. People from all over Memphis came to the funeral or sent flowers to show their sympathy for the men and their families. Ida did all she could to comfort Tom's wife and young daughter. Even though many people knew who had lynched Tom Moss and his business partners, not a single person would turn in the guilty men. No one was ever punished for the murders. Ida saw that most whites in Memphis were not willing to defend the rights of black citizens. Angry and hurt, she wrote in the free speech, there is therefore only one thing left that we can do, save our money and leave a town which will neither protect our lives and property nor give us a fair trial in the courts. Hundreds of black people did just that. They fled to other places where they hoped to escape lynching and Jim Crow laws. With the free speech's encouragement, many black residents of Memphis crossed the Mississippi River and headed west in trains, on wagons, and on foot. Despite her advice to others, Ida stayed in protest of the murder of Tom Moss and his partners. Like many Americans, she had once thought lynching was a punishment used only on the most horrible criminals. But if it could happen to Tom, she realized that other innocent people were probably being killed this way too. Ida traveled across the country to talk with people who had seen lynching up close. She read articles in the Chicago Tribune and other big city newspapers. She learned that it was most often black men, like her friend Tom, who were lynched. At the heart of the problem, she realized, was the refusal of many, of many white people to accept that black people were now free and deserved the right to a fair trial. With the facts she had gathered in hand, Ida began to tell her free speech readers the truth about lynching. Though her newspaper only reached a few thousand people, Ida was not discouraged. 
She believed that if good people, white and black, knew the true horrors of lynching, together they would find a way to stop it. While many of Ida's readers applauded her strong words against lynching, the articles angered some people in Memphis. When Ida was away on a trip, her business partner, J.L. Fleming, got word that trouble was brewing. If he didn't want to get hurt, his neighbor warned, he had better get out of town. Later, a group of white men broke into the offices of the free speech. They smashed desks, lamps, chairs, and supplies, and threw all the papers and books to the floor. The men left a note saying they would harm the owners of the newspaper if they tried to reopen it. But the mom never got the chance. Her partner had already fled, and Ida was on a train headed toward New York City. T. Thomas Fortune, the editor of the New York Age, had invited her to come for a visit. Thomas met Ida at the train station. She later described the meeting in her diary. Well, we've been a long time getting you to New York, Thomas said, but now you are here. I'm afraid you will have to stay. I can't see why that follows, Ida replied. Haven't you seen the morning paper? He handed her a copy of the New York Sun and pointed to an article. It said that the free speech office had been destroyed. Ida was shocked and angry. She wanted to go back to Memphis and rebuild the newspaper. But where would she find the money and how would she protect herself? Thomas urged Ida to stay in New York and write for his paper and he suggested that she begin with an article on lynching. The New York Age was one of the most popular black newspapers in America. After thinking it over, Ida happily agreed. Ida quickly settled into her new home and began working on an article for The Age. She had once written, the way to right wrongs is to turn a light of truth upon them. This was her chance to do just that. The morning the article appeared on newsstands, Ida walked along the street, wondering what her readers would think. Would her words really make a difference? Much to Ida's surprise, her article changed many lives. The well-known black leader, Frederick Douglass, called it a revelation. For the first time, people realized that scores of innocent lives were being claimed each year by lynch mobs. Ida's article had shown lynching for what it really was, an attack on the freedom promised to all Americans. The issue that featured Ida's article sold 10,000 copies across the nation. At least 1,000 copies were sold in Memphis alone. The mob that had silenced the free speech had actually helped Ida spread the truth about lynching. Ida had not set out to become a crusader, but the article in The Age made her just that. She received invitations from across the country to speak about lynching. Politicians, ministers, and other leaders wanted to know more about the problem and how they could help. And as she continued to write articles and speak out, support for her cause grew. Her New York Age article appeared in 1892. By her death in 1931, lynching in America had nearly come to an end. Ida took up many other campaigns in her lifetime but none were more important than her difficult crusade against lynching. Putting an end to the practice would take decades of hard work by many courageous and dedicated people. Yet Ida's firm belief in the country she loved could never be shaken. Against every fear and doubt, her voice rang out clearly. We submit all to the nation confident that in this cause, as well as all others, truth is mighty and will prevail.